time after time again, living in the fairway. Yeah, you look pretty refreshed to me. Yeah, you know, and it was totally joyful for me to play golf with you and Neville the other day. It that was, was totally joyful. It really was. I stink. And I'm glad you were, you know, healthy enough that mobile. you could go 18. It made me I happy. It made me happy. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Kevin Durant's future, Novak Djokovic's comeback, and Tiger's return to the course. But we begin today with more Pac-12 teams potentially on the move. Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports reports that the Big 12 is in discussion to add up to six Pac-12 teams, including Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, and possibly Oregon and Washington. A merger of the two conferences is also reportedly a possibility. Will on your thoughts on today's development and the USC-UCLA relocation to the Big Ten that preceded it? Well, let me go to the UCLA-USC relocation. At least, Tony, in my life, all of my life, the Big Ten and Pac, whatever it's been, 8, 10, 12, have had a relationship right, with the Big right. Ten. And so, you know, I knew what those schools were. And if, even if the relationship only played out one weekend or one day a year, New Year's Day. You know, I, you know, USC and UCLA and Stanford and Oregon's and Arizona, they, they mean something to a Big Ten kid. I'm okay with that. It's still Penn State, Maryland, and Rutgers I don't give a damn about. I don't care how long they're there. I like Nebraska being there, but these Eastern schools, I didn't want them. And I'm okay with UCLA, USC. I don't know what it means, Tony, and I don't think this latest news means anything that matters ultimately to college football. It's just going to be 40 teams in a glob, and they're going to pick right. the teams off That's the top, right. and they're going to play a playoff for a championship, and it doesn't matter because it only matters right now for the television money. That's the only reason these affiliations, these alliances matter. And so the Big Ten has done a better job of that than even the SEC, certainly than the ACC and the Big Eight and the Big 12 or whatever. You know, the, the, the Big East, I'm sorry, the Big Ten has conquered that. And that money drives this decision making. But ultimately, how many of these teams are where? I just, I'm at the point now where I don't care. It doesn't matter. So let me get, let me get to the back end of the question first, the thing that's happening today, okay. which has to do with the Pac-12 and maybe somehow the dissolution of the Pac-12. Where does this all leave the Pac-12? It leaves them exactly nowhere. Right. The exact same position as the Big 12, exactly nowhere, wondering how they could have fallen on their faces quite like this. And that's what is driving talks between those two conferences, because their commissioners over some long period of time have killed them. Because right now, in the United States of America, there are only two meaningful football conferences. There's the SEC and there's the Big Ten. That's all. What the Big Ten did under the cover of darkness was they reacted to Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC. That's and they right. said, we can't get left behind. We got to go get the two most attractive football teams in the country that are not affiliated with us or the SEC. And those two teams are UCLA and USC, Southern California. And I would tell you one other thing, Mike. I would tell you that right now, the only two teams that matter as to where they're going to end up that are not yet in the SEC or the Big Ten are Notre Dame and Clemson. That's the list, kids. Yeah. That's all there yeah. is. Nothing else matters. Yeah. And I agree with you. There's going to be a 40 or 50 team conference. Yeah, there's geographically separated yeah. top eight teams to the playoffs, national champion crowned and paid for by television. And this eliminates That's what's coming. any geographic or tribal feeling about college basketball. Because college basketball is now reduced to March. That's it. That's right. Maybe champ, no, champ right. week, as we call it now, and then March Madness. That's it. it does, they, they just said to no. hell with college basketball. They There's don't care. another point. Well, college basketball doesn't make anywhere near what college football no, makes. It There's doesn't. another point about college football. This is the end of the NCAA. Yes, it there, is. There are no well, that's rules. Good. That's a good There's thing. nothing. You don't need yeah. them anymore. You know who I hope They're gets marginalized? Done in college football. Let me be petty for just one second as we, before we move on. Notre Dame, it'd be great if Notre Dame was had its face pressed up against the glass and was just, I know the Big Ten ultimately is going to feel a need to take them yes, if they're they the are. last team yes, standing when the music stops. But I, I'd love Notre Dame to just be standing Notre there with his face Dame against the glass and, and nowhere to go. Notre Dame and Clemson are the only two Man. more teams that matter. That's yeah, it. You're right. We move now to the biggest cloud hanging over NBA free agency still, wither Kevin Durant. 
Durant has asked the Nets to trade him. There's a report in the New York Post today that the Nets are open to keeping Durant, though Durant appears to have no interest in staying there. Wilbon, where do you think Durant is most likely to end up and when? Tony, you know, I told you this on your podcast yesterday. I would not be entirely shocked if Kevin Durant stayed in Brooklyn. I wouldn't. Because I think it's going to be so difficult to get a trade that's going to make him happy, not that they have to run it past him, because he doesn't have a no-trade clause in his contract. But if we're just talking about the new destination saying, we don't want to have this, even though we got him for four years, we want his best for that time. Kevin Durant's going to be 34 years old. I'm not even sure that you want to give up five first-round draft picks plus an all-star, plus another player, a frontline player, to have a guy who's going to be 34, and maybe you'll get three great years. Maybe because Kevin Durant is so unique physically as well, you get four great years. But still, I could see him in Brooklyn. I don't know where because they don't know where. Durant doesn't know where. The teams don't know where. All the teams that want him, and every indication, as I know from people I've talked to, half the teams, if not more, have made inquiries, okay? So nobody knows where he's going to be. And the, the deal is oh. going to be so convoluted, Tony, that leads, if there is one, to wherever he lands, that we can't sit here right now with a crystal ball and see that. He is at Miami and Phoenix. I'd like one of those more than the others. But who the hell knows? Okay. So we're in the first week in July. So I'm going to sit here and I'm going to wait for Kevin Durant to go wherever he wants to go and take all the time you need. It doesn't matter to me. Wherever he lands is going to be a contending team. Obviously, everybody knows that, you know, because he's a great player. Even as his age advances, he's still a great, great, great player. What stands out to me about all of this is that Kevin Durant finally decided, I can't play with Kyrie Irving anymore. I don't want anything to do with him anymore. Kevin Durant, whatever his flaws are, it's always seemed to me that he likes to play basketball. He gets hurt and he can't play. But Kyrie Irving just doesn't like to play and just stops playing whenever he doesn't want to play. And, Mike, I cannot separate separate this timeline. The day after Kyrie Irving said, I'm opting in, Kevin Durant said, I'm opting out. The day after, to me, two and two equals four. I don't think they will go anywhere together outside of Brooklyn to play, and I don't know what they're going to do. I will say this about Kevin Durant. I have the numbers somewhere. I think he's played 90 games. In the last three years, he's played 90 games out of a possible 226 in Brooklyn. And if he gets hurt again at his age, that could be the beginning of the end. People in D.C., of course, say, oh, let him come home. He's not coming to D.C. They're not going to trade Bradley Beal. But Bradley Beal and Kyrie Irving can't play together. The the interesting, most interesting thing to me would be if he went to Golden State. But, Mike, we've talked about this, you and I. He left that team and those players for a reason. I don't think he's going back there. But, again... If it's I'm, the first week in July. Yeah, Tony, Do what you want. If I'm the Warriors, I'm not blowing up what I've got. I just won a championship without him. I don't need to yeah, blow so, up yeah. what I've got to get right. a 34-year-old right. dude back as great as Kevin Durant is. And the, th- the, thing that, the thing I'm left with with Kyrie Irving is the two greatest players of his generation, LeBron James and Kevin Durant, he couldn't get along with the two of them. He yeah. couldn't get along with the two of them. He can't play with them. And they basically ultimately said, oh, no, enough of this dude. So all the people who want to praise Kyrie because of his handles, you can't be with him. He's toxic. Wake up. Let's move to Wimbledon, where Novak Djokovic came back from two sets down to beat Yannick Center, or maybe it's Janik Center, this morning in advance of the men's semis. Over the long weekend, Rafael Nadal advanced to the quarters, as did, as did Nick Kyrgios. Crazy Nick. And the women's draw mm. lost top mm. seed, Iga Sviantek, who went out to Alize Cornet on Saturday. Tone of all of this stuff, what's the biggest yeah. news? Okay, well, the biggest deal would have been if Djokovic lost. Djokovic lost. Right. There's no question about that. That's I right. watched that match. He dominated the last three sets, as he should have. So that's off the board now. So if you're asking me what's the biggest deal, I will tell you it's Rafael Nadal still in it and looking better each time. Rafael Nadal, I believe, has had straight set victories in his last two matches. Um, and, and you can blue sky a little bit about a grand slam. He won the Australian where I believe he beat Djokovic. He won the French. I don't think he can win on no, grass. I don't think Djokovic so. couldn't play any Australian, remember? Djokovic couldn't play That's any right. Australian. That's right. 
Okay, he was, so he was you're right out. about that. Yeah, he right. was out so, of the Right, okay. So I don't think he can win on grass, but the more you look at him, the more you think maybe he can win on grass. The other thing for me, Mike, and I'll go back to it, it's over a week old, but the most thrilling thing I saw in Wimbledon was Serena Williams and Harmony Tan. I mean, that was a great, great match. We may never see Harmony Tan again, but that was a, a piece of theater that it I enjoyed. It was theater, Tony, but I'm going to go bigger than that. And the Washington Post had a nice piece on this, I, I think it's today, it could have been yesterday, about you have so many names. You and I now look at these matches. We come in, we're going to talk about them on our show. We follow tennis all of our lives and now you have a string of new players and new names, and we have to learn how to pronounce them. And I told you this some weeks ago, particularly the women's side, as you have this big transition. You've transitioned yeah. out of Serena and Venus, and I don't mean to be, you know, insensitive, because I've loved watching them for 20 years, both of them. But, but it moves on now. The caravan moves on. And you have all of these new young players on both sides of the draw. And Federer's gone, and Joker's going to go, and the dollar's probably going to go before Joker. And that's the fascinating thing about Wimbledon to me, is I get locked in, and I'm watching new players all the time. Yeah. And you go, wow, these kids are really talented. That's the takeaway for me as I take my time to learn about an entire new generation of players. Yeah. It's a great slogan, the dogs bark, but the caravan moves caravan on. Let's moves take a on. break. Coming up... How should Tiger feel about his return to the course? And did the Timberwolves pay too steep a price for Rudy Gobert? Hell yeah! Yes! Mike, I think it's critical for Djokovic to win. If he doesn't, I don't think he'll catch Nadal. I think he's got to win here because he's not playing the Open. Yeah, but he's got next year. We don't know what the conditions are going to bring. Although those he's youngsters... He's getting older, too, and you say yes, younger people the youngsters are coming up. Are at his heels. <laughs> mail time where your issues become our problems let me see what's first here. we have no problems how should tiger woods feel about his first two rounds in ireland tony you know i've turned i'm, I'm doing a 180 here because i'm watching tiger play and i'm thinking this is not you know this isn't great i mean you know he, he's, he's five over and then he goes to seven over and he made a couple of putts today i guess it was today earlier and I thought, this is just not great. This is not the Tiger Woods we expect to see. And then I, I listened to Tiger. I listened to him talk about how grateful he is to be out there on his own leg. And he doesn't know what it's going to yield. And he feels great. And he, can, he wants to play in St. Andrews while he's in the best condition he can be and perhaps content. And I did a 180. He should feel great. He should feel great to be out there, given what happened to him, whatever it was, a year and a half ago, whatever it was. Grateful. And I think he is. Have you watched this thing? Have you watched this event in Ireland that I started bit, watching last yeah. night, obviously on tape, the J.P. McManus Pro-Am, which I'd never heard of? Did you see who's in the field? Yes. Tiger, Rory, Rahm, Scheffler, Justin Thomas, Spieth, Shoffley, Cantlay, Lowry, Moore, the greatest players in the world. Somebody's ponying up some money. Money, They're the baby. greatest players in the world. This is like the Seminole Pro member on steroids. Let me talk about Tiger for a second because there was the bell. The other day, he looked like he was wearing a full body armor suit. Nice vest. He looked to have no Great flexibility, vest. and he's riding in a cart. But let's understand something, because I'm with you. He's going to play St. Andrews. Yeah. He wants to play St. Yeah. Andrews. He's going from Ireland to Scotland to play it. And he's going in wind, in rain, in cold, in sleet. He's the U.S. mail being delivered, baby. That's what's going to happen. It is. And it's, look, I, I want to watch it. I'm not going to have expectations, or I'm going to try not to. Do you understand why the Timberwolves gave up five first-round picks for your boy Rudy Gobert? Yes, I do. So two things, more than one thing can be true, Tom. You know I'm fond of saying that. This, this haul is way too much for Rudy Gobert, and the Timberwolves did exactly, I think, what they should have done. Because, Tony, they're not getting, they're not a destination. No place other than Miami and L.A. are destination for free agents. But Minnesota certainly is not. And so they got Rudy Gobert to go next to Carl Anthony Towns. And Carl Anthony Towns, who doesn't want to play center, who wants to be, you know, Mr. Stretch 4, can now do his thing there. And they got Anthony Edwards. And Minnesota, I don't think I would put them in the top four in the West to start the season. But, Tony, they got the personnel to compete. They do. And with a little inspiration and maybe good luck and good chemistry and good fit, maybe they will threaten in the West. 
But you got to do that with trade or draft in Minnesota, not free yeah. agency. Do I understand it? I understand it. I understand they got a new GM named Tim Conley. Tim Conley, And he good. just made the biggest splash in the pool. Yeah, yeah. And he just said, look at me and look at what I can do. And what he's banking on, because his job depends on it, is that Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns bring them to the finals of the Western Conference, even though neither yes. has been there before. Yes. Because they don't need any offense from Gobert, Mike. They had the number one offense in the league with those people you're talking about. They need defense. That's why he's there. Tim Conley's all in on this, and we're going to watch and see Michael what happens. Conley's I think it's a good I do, too. Michael, I thought it was we Tim. Do. Well, see, I don't even know him. But he's going to be the GM of the year if it works. Enough email. And he's out if it doesn't. Let's take one last break. Still to come, Max Scherzer. Presented by Corona Extra. Find the fine life. Live La Vida Maspina. Part of Happy Hour. Happy time, people. Happy 28th birthday, Shohei Otani. The reigning American League MVP has 18 home runs, 51 RBI, and an OPS at 848. That would be enough to get him noticed as a hitter. But Otani is a superb pitcher as well. So far this season, Otani is 7-4 with a 2.68 ERA and 101 strikeouts and 74 innings pitched. Although the Angels are 37-44 and, and have lost four out of the last five, Otani's 4-0 in his last four starts. He's only allowed one earned run in 26 and two-thirds innings. Otani and Mike Trout may be the two best players in baseball, and their team can win. Tony, it reminds me of the team of my youth, the Chicago Cubs, with Ernie Banks and Billy Williams and Ron Sano and Fergie Jenkins, all Hall of Famers, and couldn't even get to the postseason. This reminds me of that. The Angels have got some players. They, they can't get anything done. Happy anniversary, Bjorn Borg. On this day 42 years ago, Borg won his fifth straight Wimbledon title, beating John McEnroe in five sets. This was Borg's last Wimbledon title, and this match is often cited as the best Wimbledon final ever played. Borg had two match points in the fourth set, but McEnroe held on and forced a tiebreak that McEnroe would win 18-16. In the tiebreak, Borg saved six set points, McEnroe saved five match points. Borg won the fifth set, later commented he had a feeling his dominance was coming to an end. And in the next major, the U.S. Open, McEnroe beat Borg in five sets. Borg would win only one more major, the 1981 French Open. Tone, I remember that as the greatest summer, I think, of tennis of my life. Also, Tone, 75 years ago today, Larry Doby became the second black player in the major leagues, the first, of course, in the American League about seven weeks after the debut of Jackie Robinson. A melancholy trail to Hank Goldberg. The hammer died yesterday on the exact day he was born 82 years ago. Hank grew up in sports. His father was sports editor of a newspaper in New Jersey. Hank settled in Miami when Miami had the Dolphins and spring training and not much else. He saw the rise of the U and the arrival of the Heat, the Panthers, and the Marlins, and by then, he was the king of South Florida on radio and television. Hank was a tout and a rack on tour, and he eventually made his picks on football and horses on national television for ESPN. He had a table at Joe's Stone Crab, and he had Don Shula's ear. And for many years in Miami, that was all you needed. Hank Goldberg was a lovely, jovial man and a good friend. Tony, just think, with the proliferation of legal sports betting, where you can essentially bet now at the arenas and stadiums, think of how huge Hank would be going forward. And I think maybe that's part of the legacy of his career now as we go into this new era with so much betting around sports. Let's go to the big finish. Let's the San it. Jose Sharks hired Mike Greer as a sports first jack black general manager. Your thoughts? It's on the family business. Brother of Dolphins GM Chris Greer, son of Bobby Greer, who was the Patriots personnel boss before the two kids. Amazing. Talk about his story. Great for them and congratulations. The Lightning traded Ryan McDonough to the Predators in a cost-cutting move. You surprised? No, because you tell me they do this all the time, but I think it's awful. Yeah. And when a team is that good, they the shouldn't NHL. have to shed salary yes, like that. They do. The Giants have lost five in a row. Is that cause for concern? Tony, you're losing contact with the Dodgers. Nine and a half back in the Dodgers now. And they're, what, two games out of the third wild card slot? Yeah, cause for concern. Your boy Max Scherzer returns to the mound for the Mets tonight in Cincinnati. Your expectations are what? Back from Binghamton in the Rumble Ponies. I think he'll go six innings, maybe give up two earned. Hope it's a good showing for the Warrior God. Last one. Astros have won seven in a row. Will they make it eight against the Royals tonight? Zach Grinke versus Luis Garcia. I think they will, Tone. I'm sort of rooting for Dusty Baker now, which means 
I'm rooting for the Strolls. I am. I'm done with my out of time. Out of time, trying to do better the next time. Colleen and Courtney, shout out. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcast. Astros off probation, at least for me. And now, your sports center.